All right, class, let's start up with our discussion on biotechnology. First, we need to talk about restriction endonucleases. A restriction endonuclease is kind of a $10 term. What is it really? It's, in a, ter in a sentence, an enzyme that cuts DNA. All a restriction endonuclease is, is an enzyme that cuts DNA at a specific spot. Now, we found that we can use restriction endonucleases for genetic engineering. These are the hammer and the biochemist's toolkit, or in the, in the molecular biologist's toolbox, so to speak. These enzymes can recognize very specific spots of DNA and break the phosphodiester bonds that hold those DNA molecules together. Phosphodiester bond is the kind of chemical bond that holds the carbon, excuse me, the phosphate and the sugar backbone together in the DNA molecule. Now, these restriction endonucleases serve an important function for the microorganism. If we take foreign DNA and insert it into an organism, the restriction endonucleases that are floating around in the cytoplasm are going to start chopping up that DNA. So restriction endonucleases, in a sense, are going to protect these microorganisms against viral attack. So they attack, protect bacteria against bacteriophages, and they can protect other microorganisms against viral attack. These restriction endonucleases recognize very specific regions on our DNA fragments. These regions are read the same forwards and back as they are backwards. They are known as a palindrome. My favorite palindrome is taco cat. Taco cat will always spell taco cat if you spell it forwards or backwards. When a restriction endonuclease cuts this DNA fragment at the palindrome, there's almost always going to be a sticky end. A couple restriction endonucleases cut the DNA so that there is not a sticky end. Those restriction endonucleases are not very helpful. We preferentially are going to use the restriction endonucleases that leave single-stranded pieces of DNA to make the sticky ends at the at the cut site. These restriction endonucleases allow us to mix and match pieces of DNA with each other. This single-stranded piece of DNA at the end, or sticky end, it will base pair with complementary nucleotides on another fragment of DNA. So if we can d design our favorite DNA sequence and insert the, n the correct palindromes at the end of that DNA sequence, we can take that DNA sequence, expose it to the restriction endonuclease to give it sticky ends that will allow it to stick into a nuclear genome or another into another larger fragment of DNA based on matching up the sticky ends with them. There's a term for the piece of DNA that's been processed by restriction endonuclease. It is known as a restriction fragment. And the differences between our restriction fragments can be referred to as an RFLP, a rough, a rough or a restriction fragment length polymorphism. These polymorphisms can occur based off of the differences between our restriction endonucleases. While I'm talking about these restriction endonucleases, it's worth mentioning that ECHO R1 and HIN D3 are probably the two most popular ones. They're the ones I spent the most time working with, but there's a wide variety of these restriction endonucleases. So let's first <coughs> talk about some of these molecular processes that we can use. We'll get back to when we have our discussion on PCR, we'll talk about heating and cooling. We can heat the DNA up. This is sometimes referred to as melting DNA, or when we hit the melting temp. And when we hit this heating or melting temp of the DNA, where'd my mouse go? There it is. We can actually break the hydrogen bonds that hold the DNA molecules together. And then if we cool off the DNA, the hydrogen bonds that hold the A's, T's, C's, and G's together can reform, and the DNA will relink and become double-stranded. Here are some excellent palindromes. We have G-A-A-T-T-C, and then here we have G-A-A-T-T-C. This, frag this fragment of DNA is read the same forwards and backwards. And we can see if we cut this segment of DNA, that there'll be... We'll cut it at the G, A mark, and then there'll be a single strand AATT hanging out as the sticky tail. These sticky tails that are hanging out are very useful. Echo R1 and HIN D3 both leave sticky tails. The reason I've never heard of HAE HI3 is because it doesn't leave that sticky tail end, so 
for a molecular biologist, who the heck cares? It's not very helpful because we can't mix and match the pieces of DNA. If I cut the DNA to leave the sticky tails, those single-stranded sticky tails, if we look down here in the lower right corner, those single-stranded sticky tails can then base pair with the same bases and form new hydrogen bonds to insert DNA fragments. So here is our vector plasmid. This has been a circular piece of DNA, and I can cut that circular piece of DNA with the same restriction in the nuclease that I cut my favorite gene out of my organism with and then I can insert my favorite gene into the plasmid and now I've just designed a little circular piece of DNA that contains my favorite gene whatever that gene is and I can use this little circular piece of plasmid and insert it into a bacterium and then grow that bacterium to replicate and produce a lot of my favorite plasmid. The restriction of nucleases are going to reply, depend on some other very essential enzymes. One is ligase. Ligase is going to firmly cement or seal our favorite gene into the piece of DNA that we're patching it into. It's used once we're done splicing in our favorite gene and it will solidify the bonds. So the ligase is going to reform the phosphodiester bonds between the phosphate and, car and sugar backbones of the DNA. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that will take pieces of RNA and convert it back into DNA. Very specifically, we'll use that re reverse transcriptase to take messenger RNA and convert it back into DNA, or we call this complementary DNA. This cDNA, or copied DNA, so to speak, or complementary DNA, can be made from a fully processed piece of RNA. So if we think back to our eukaryotic cells. Our eukaryotic cells go through RNA processing. They remove the introns and leave the exons in the fragment of DNA. If you take a fully processed piece of messenger RNA, you can use reverse transcriptase to turn it back into a piece of DNA and then take that piece of DNA and insert it into a it'll come to me a plasmid that small circular piece of DNA and then insert it into your favorite microorganism and produce lots of your favorite protein that was made by your favorite gene moving on though let's talk about gel electrophoresis gel electrophoresis is a way of separating small molecules based on their size, shape, and electric charge. When you think of DNA fingerprinting and you look at a picture of many small lines on a screen, you're probably looking at a picture of a gel. All DNA has an electric charge to it. Phosphate groups generally have a negative three charge. So if we have a phosphate sugar backbone, that DNA is going to have an overall negative charge. This overall negative charge on a DNA molecule means that if I run an electric current through a solution, DNA is going to preferentially move towards the positive electrode in that, in that solution because of the overall negative charge. Positive attracts negative. The larger fragments of DNA, though, are going to move more slowly, and this is kind of counterintuitive intuitive. The reason our larger fragments move slowly is because they bump into more stuff as they're moving across the container. And the stuff usually is going to be a matrix or a gelatin of agarose. So large pieces of DNA move slowly because they bump into more molecules on the way, but smaller pieces of DNA will zoom across the container and move very quickly. We are then going to take the, the gel that the DNA has been moving through, and we are going to stain it. We're going to expose it to a chemical that makes it so that we can see the DNA fragments. A very common one that's kind of falling out of favor was ethidium bromide. Um, CyberSafe is now slightly more popular. It's not quite as carcinogenic as ethidium bromide. As at the very end of this process, we can look at all the bands and the lines and determine the size and peak sizes of the DNA molecules and then come up with a genetic fingerprint. So we'll take our restriction endonuclease, whatever the heck that restriction endonuclease is, and we'll chop up our DNA molecule and get a bunch of different sizes and pieces. And then we'll insert that into well number three. Each different well is going to have a different DNA sample and or 
be chopped up by a, a different restriction in the nuclease. It's also important that we have a frame of reference. Our frame of reference is known as the ladder. And this ladder is going to be, typically be on one of the ends of our gel. We then run the electric current through the gel. And we can see that in samples one, we have a, a larger band. In sample two, we have a smaller band. In samples three, we have a small, medium, and a really large band. And then in sample four, we have just a very large band. And then over here in our well, we have our DNA ladder. These give us our frame of reference so that we can know how big or small these molecules are in the sample wells. This is based off of a logarithmic curve, and you need to do some math. We aren't going to go over that in this class. Our last piece of DNA replication that we're going to talk about is polymerase chain reaction. You can think of polymerase chain reaction as a photocopier or a Xerox machine for DNA. What do we do with PCR or polymerase chain reaction? We make many, many copies of DNA molecules. And it's the specific DNA molecules that we are interested in that we make the copies of. This is very sensitive. It's sensitive enough to detect one single cell out of a tissue culture. It's sensitive enough to diagnose an infection from a pathogen if we have one single copy of that pathogen's DNA. It's also very rapid. Generally speaking, polymerase chain reaction can be done in as short as 10 hours. And 10 hours may seem like a long time to you for the microwave generation, but compared to the prior laboratory techniques, PCR is crazy fast. So what do we need for polymerase chain reaction work? First, we need our primers. Our primers are small pieces of DNA that are used as the starting points for the DNA polymerase to start copying the DNA. Depending on what gene we want to copy, we are going to give specific primers to our solution. The primers can be designed. They are short strands of DNA that tell us where to start copying the DNA. Then we need to have the enzyme that actually does the copying. This is going to be DNA polymerase from a thermophilic bacteria. Thermos aquaticus is the bacterium of choice. Its DNA polymerase is referred to as TAC polymerase. Why is TAC polymerase so important? TAC polymerase is a enzyme that's been isolated from an archaea, uh, specifically Thermos aquaticus, and this is an, a, an archaeal species that can live at very high temperatures, hence its name, Thermos. It lives in boiling water springs. So it, this uh, DNA polymerase is special because it does not become denatured at very high temperatures. It remains active. It remains in its native state. And this means we can use it over and over again well, we put the solution in a thermal cycler. A thermal cycler will heat up the solution, cool it off, heat it up, cool it off, heat it up, cool it off. And by changing the temperature of the solution, we can cause the DNA to become single-stranded, then cause the primers to bind, then cause the DNA to be copied, and then make the copy single-stranded again, cause the primers to bind, so on and so forth. We can repeat the process. Generally speaking, about 34 times is enough to get an easy measurement. So, here we'll start with our original DNA sample, and this is a summary figure for D DNA, or excuse me, for PCR. We'll start with our summer, our an original sample. We heat it up, we melt the DNA, so to speak, and the DNA becomes single-stranded. Then our primers attach. After the primers attach, TAC polymerase will then synthesize a new strand of DNA in the, from the five prime to three prime direction. So our two single-stranded pieces of DNA now each became double-stranded pieces of DNA. These new double-stranded pieces of DNA are then heated up again, new primers attach, and then TAC polymerase can be reused to make the new double str single-stranded pieces of DNA a double-stranded piece of DNA. So after two rounds, we went from one copy to four copies of our favorite gene. So each single round, we double the number of copies. Um, when I worked on a PCR, or when I worked on a thermocycler to perform PCR in a lab setting, usually I'd be done running this um, cycle of heating and cooling in about three hours. Um, every once in a while I'd run for three and a half. 
um, the prepping of the chemicals, the prepping of the DNA, and then the interpretation of the results. Usually I did a couple hours. Start to finish, you could do the entire thing in 10 hours, no problem. Let's look at some recombinant DNA technology. This is the ability, when we talk about recombination, we're mixing and matching DNA from multiple organisms. We can make bacteria specifically to make our favorite hormone, enzyme, or vaccine. Now, you might want to pause for a second here and think, but Bob, what the heck? Bacteria don't go through RNA processing. How can we design a bacterium to produce a human hormone when that human DNA needs to go through RNA, or the human messenger RNA needs to go through RNA processing? And bacteria don't have the mechanisms for RNA processing. I'm glad you asked. If we go back a couple slides here, we will insert complementary DNA. So if we take fully processed messenger RNA from a eukaryotic cell and we expose it to reverse transcriptase, we can make complementary DNA and then insert that complementary DNA into a bacterium and we can get a bacterium to now start making eukaryotic proteins or eukaryotic ends, um, molecules. This is very exciting. We can also specifically design bacteria to make our favorite um, enzyme that is from a bacterial source or an archaeal source. If we are going to use a make a vaccine that depends specifically on a few of the subunits of that pathogen, this is how we're going to go about programming the bacterium to produce lots of those subunits for the vaccine production. We can also make a genetic clone using recombinant DNA technology. We'll take our favorite gene, whatever gene you want, from our plant animal and put it into the host organism. This donor gene has to be cut up by restriction endonucleases. It must be isolated from the host genome, or the donor genome, I should say. And then we typically need to amplify that donor gene using PCR. So then we have a, sl a little vial with a high concentration of our favorite gene. And then we take our favorite gene and insert it into a plasmid or a virus. Um, these are known as vectors. A vector is just something that's used to move the gene. Uh, the vector then takes the gene and puts it into the host, and the host is then going to replicate or er, go through many rounds of cellular division and will then give us our favorite protein. This DNA that is removed by cells and separated by restriction endonucleases needs to have the correct vectors assigned to them. These clone fragments that we are going to clone need to be probed to make sure that they have the desired sequences of DNA. So we need to have some kind of a proofreading mechanism. As I mentioned before, we will take our messenger RNA that's been fully processed and turn it into DNA with reverse transcriptase and take that complementary DNA and shove it into a thermocycler and amplify it with PCR. We can maintain our segments of DNA in a genomic library. A genomic library is just a big collection of DNA clones. It represents the entire genome of its, your specific organism. These DNA libraries are typically going to be maintained with segments of the genome of your favorite organism being replicated and cloned in a host microorganism. Plasmids are the cloning vector of choice in most situations. They're an itty bitty chunk of DNA. They're very easy to manipulate and they can be used to have proofreading mechanisms built in. Um, when I would design a mutant in a laboratory, I would insert my favorite gene into a plasmid and at the same time, my plasmid would have an antibiotic resistance gene in it as well. So there'd be an antibiotic resistance gene, and then I would put my favorite gene in the plasmid. So there'd be two genes. That antibiotic resistance gene was a, a quality control gene. I would grow my mutant strains of bacteria a uh, nutrient agar that contained an antibiotic. And that way, I knew if they were growing on the nutrient agar, they probably had my, my, spe my plasmid in them because they were resistant to the antibiotic. And if they were growing on the antibiotic and had my plasmid, they also probably had my favorite gene that I just inserted in the plasmid as well.
Bacteriophages are viruses that attack bacteria. They have the ability to squirt their DNA into the bacterial horse through the process of transduction, and that will be used to modify the host genome. Our vectors are typically going to contain that gene that contains a drug resistance for their hosts so that we can select for only hosts that have been transformed by the vector. So here we have our donor d genome. Here's that donor piece of DNA. We take that donor DNA and our vector, our plasmid, and we'll cut both with the same restriction endonuclease. So here's a slice going through our donor gene. That donor gene has some sticky ends on it now. Our donor plas or our vector plasmid will have matching complementary sticky ends. The donor gene will stick into the donor plasmid. And then that donor plasmid can be inserted into our microorganism. And then while that microorganism is containing that vector pla that our engineered plasmid, that microorganism will then take our donor gene that we put in the plasmid, produce messenger RNA, go through transcription, translation, make our favorite protein, and then we purify out our favorite protein and have our protein of choice. This is one of the ways that we now produce human insulin through in an industrial scale. Beforehand, back in the dark ages, so to speak, we would use horse insulin and dog insulin or pig insulin to treat diabetics. So to get that shot of insulin, an entire, organ, an entire animal, an entire mammal had to die. Now we've designed microorganisms to produce human insulin and we purify the human insulin on industrial scales and it's much cheaper and we don't have to kill as many animals in the process. So, whew, that was a lot. Wow. Whew, let's take a moment and breathe here because normally that's several chapters um, depending on the textbook you're looking at. So, concept check class. Our restriction endonuclease is what? A, something that makes cuts to DNA at palindromes. B, something that leaves sticky ends at the ends of the DNA cuts. C, are used by bacteria to protect against bac invading bacteriophage DNA. D, are important for genetic engineering. Or E, all of the above are correct. This is a poorly written multiple choice question. Obviously the answer is E, all of the above are correct. So, if you have any questions about this material, please shoot me an email or post them on the discussion board. Happy studies!